at the cut-off position we had taken in the bend of the Dniefa, to which we had retreated again after the unsuccessful attack. Our unit had been long enough to equip and strengthen the defensive line. To the north there was fierce fighting. The Kiev bridgehead was still held there on the east bank, but the Russians were pressing on with increasing forces. On 6 November the Wehrmacht was knocked out of Kiev. The Red Army advanced by forced march to Zitomir and Korosten, but then it was again pushed back to Kiev. In our section, the Russians were only making false attacks to confuse the cards of the German command. I was just with one of the platoon leaders when Russian artillery rained a hail of shells on our positions. We rushed to the nearest bunker. Two heavy shells exploded at the very entrance to the bunker, and several attacks by Soviet bombers did their job. We were pelted with earth. I was wedged between two beams. My mouth and nose were covered with earth and my stomach was pounded by someone's foot. I could hear the muffled sounds of shells and bombs exploding. A helmet-sized empty space formed above my head and I was able to gulp some air. I was happy that I was able to move my fingers and clench my fist and that the blows on my stomach gradually stopped. But my thoughts kept me awake. If the Russians broke through, there would be no one left who knew we were buried here. No one to dig us out and we would suffocate. I tried to shout, but all I heard was my faint moan. Then it was over. When I opened my eyes, I saw the sky above me and the face of our divisional doctor. We were dug in right under the fire of the Soviet guns. The artillery was now silent and the bombers had returned to their base of operations. A few meters away from me lay two corpses, the platoon commander and his liaison. One of them probably belonged to the boot that struck me in the stomach. I was unable to move. I looked at the passing clouds and did not think whether I should feel happy or not. I felt a terrible headache and nausea. Suddenly the general, to whom the overzealous radio operator had already reported my departure, appeared. The red sashes and gold buttonholes performed a miracle for a moment. I jumped to my feet and put my hand to my head, though I was wearing neither helmet nor cap. But I couldn't finish my report. I threw up. I fell back on the grass. It is possible that my relatively quick recovery was aided by a bottle of champagne, which the general and his motorcyclist sent an hour later, and Dr. Haberman did everything necessary to ensure that I overcame the effects of the shock as soon as possible. Gradually winter came, though not so suddenly as in the north. For the third time Christmas was approaching on the Eastern Front. We weren't in a very festive mood. We had once thought that we would celebrate Christmas 1941 at home. We had long ago surrendered our positions on the Dniper, and in the fierce battles for the area Zetomir, fast off we had suffered huge losses. The hopeless attempt to retake Kiev cost great sacrifices. Whatever the high command did, everything turned out to be an ill-conceived, fruitless venture. I did not realize then that the whole campaign was ultimately doomed. One could despair when an exhausted battalion was dictated tasks for which a combat-ready division would have been insufficient. Soldiers often had to show superhuman effort. During the retreat, however, the strongest were saved, the weaker ones died on the way, in human morality. But haven't we ourselves preached the morality of the arrogant elite for years? Although we hardly spoke of it, a significant part in this retreat was the fear that the Russians, who had survived the horrors of the German invasion, would not repay us in the same coin. The material part could still be replenished somehow. Worse was the case with replenishment. When an old soldier of our unit returned from the hospital, we rejoiced more than when ten new recruits arrived. To reinforce our positions we were assigned a marching battalion, whose efficiency nobody could determine, because the soldiers hardly knew each other. Christmas was approaching and we had been stockpiling refreshments for weeks. There was also a special ration cigarettes, cigars, vodka and cognac. There was a relative calm on the front line, and one could assume that somehow we would still be able to celebrate Christmas. So the long-awaited hour came. The improvised Christmas trees were decorated with silver paper from cigarette boxes. Company field officers, supply officers and liaison officers distributed snacks and parcels that had arrived from the homeland. Here and there Christmas songs played on the harmonica were heard. Pots rattled and corks flew out of bottles. Suddenly the Soviet offensive began. Many hours of hurricane fire ploughed our positions. The ground shook. The earth danced, infantrymen and soldiers of the marching battalion who lost their heads from terror and fear, ran out of trenches and bunkers. Then came the volleys of a thousand barrels, and a shaft of fire swept over our heads, raining down behind us on the fleeing infantrymen, on the camouflaged vehicles, 
on the command posts and on the positions of our artillery, which at that moment began to barrage. Following the tanks moving forward, which quickly suppressed the fire of the few machine gun nests, columns of Red Army soldiers were advancing. At first I, together with the soldiers of my command post, remained in the bunker. Around everything was rumbling. We were trembling with fear. We had no choice but to wait. Leaving the bunker was tantamount to suicide. The telephone cable was broken. A direct hit destroyed the radio in my car. The liaisons were killed dead. When the shelling of our section stopped, we jumped out of the bunker. We ran over to the hillock, behind which the command post was located, and we saw four tanks crawling along, followed by infantry. The Russians had broken through the barrage of our artillery and were now moving forward unhindered. I had only one anti-tank gun, five liaisons and a squad of sepers stationed in a neighbouring bunker. The divisional doctor and adjutant were also here. We let the tanks get within a few metres. Then we opened a frantic fire from all anti-tank guns, and the anti-tank gun took up positions nearby on the back slope and with the first shot knocked out one of the Soviet tanks. Salvo after Salvo followed, but the rest of the T-34s disappeared into a ravine. Only an hour later they appeared again. Now eight tanks were advancing on our positions and with a thunderous hurrah. The Russian infantry was advancing. Suddenly there was a roar behind us and a dozen shells from six barrel mortars swept over us with a frantic squeal. This delayed the Russian attack. In addition, our anti-tank gun hit two more tanks. I immediately sent a contact to the battery of six barrel mortars with a request to support us with fire. The battery commander relayed that the division had withdrawn to a new line and that he had shot his last ammunition. He ordered us to destroy the mortars and withdraw and the division's position. We were again left to ourselves. However, our resistance and the sudden volley of six barrel mortars must have given the enemy the false impression that he was dealing with strong units here. Before attacking our hill again, the Russians subjected us and the immediate rear to artillery fire, but our division was already entrenched in new positions. Half an hour later, two Soviet tanks appeared again. They incautiously shooting back, went round the hill. I ordered the anti-tank gun to turn round and destroy the tank. The other was moving straight at our positions. The machine guns were completely insufficient to deal with it, but there was no way it could be allowed to continue its movement. It would have crushed us in the small trenches. I took cover with the doctor in a trench. We saw the tank approaching meter by meter. It was shelling our hill now and then with shrapnel shells. The motor roared, the tank rushed forward and stopped again at the trench. Then everything happened extremely fast. I grabbed two magnetic mines and ran out towards the tank. Having run forward, I jumped on the tank, lowered the safety, attached a mine and ran away. The Red Army men noticed me and, in order to cover their tank, fired machine guns. The tank passed a few meters and then the mine exploded. The tank caught fire. The crew who jumped out of the tank could not escape capture. The driver was wounded. The rest of the crew were in a desperate situation under the muzzles of our machine guns and automatic rifles. I ordered them to be taken to the division's location. At that time, only cowardice was used to explain the flight of individual soldiers or mass panic. I consider this simplistic assessment to be completely wrong. Likewise, I consider it inappropriate when, when speaking of episodes such as the one just described, everything is explained by bravery. After the battle was over, it was rare for anyone to be able to explain precisely why he had acted as he did. The stimulus may have been the exasperation caused by the incessant blows of the enemy. Partly a sense of self-preservation and often a good portion of alcohol had its effect. We were ordered to go to our deaths and we fought for ourselves to survive. Only with profound ignorance could this madness be glorified as heroism. The Soviet tank slowly died down and we were again under heavy artillery and mortar fire. Then followed two more attempts to storm our high ground. An anti-tank gun had already disabled a tank that had tried to outflank us. Shrapnel shells lay on the Russian side. The fight for the height and for the road lasted almost six hours, but gradually the situation became more than critical. One soldier was killed, five were wounded. Ammunition could at best suffice to repel two more attacks. We had to reckon with the fact that the enemy had figured out our plan. I therefore decided to clear the hill and withdraw to the main divisional forces. We put our wounded on the self-propelled vehicle and, ducking down, slowly climbed out of the gaps. Our machine gunner was firing indiscriminately in order to disguise the retreat. 
Then he joined us. We reached the edge of the forest behind the hill, descended into the ravine and moved westwards. It was already dark when we reached the first guard of our division, passed through the new front line of the defence and the improvised positions, which had been hastily equipped and which were now certainly to be held, and not without difficulty found the new command post of the division, which was situated in a peasant's hut. I reported to the general what had happened. He quickly extended his hand to me and turned to one of the regimental commanders in the hut. But then the head of the operations department, a young lieutenant colonel, took me into a turn. I explained to him on the map the whole course of events of the past day. The general, coming to the table, listened to my report. When I finished, the head of the operations department, When did you receive the division order? I knew nothing about the order, but the head of the operations department in a sharp tone began to interrogate me. What are you pretending? You were supposed to withdraw to the division by noon. When did you receive the order? Finally it came to me that a liaison had been sent to me who had not reached me. You should have received the order, again said the chief of operations. Hmm, I'm sorry, Mr. Lieutenant Colonel, but all day I have not received any news from the division. I sent a liaison to the rear with captured tankers, but I have not received any response, let alone an order. And said chief of operations suddenly changed tactics and asked, If you did not receive any order, why did you withdraw in that case? By my own decision, Mr. Lieutenant Colonel, we had fulfilled our task, we had heavy losses and little ammunition left. Holding the position any longer was pointless and would have cost unnecessary casualties. At best we would have been captured. Windsor, you idiot, shouted the General. Chief of Operations continued to scold me. It wasn't your job to hold this hill all day. You should have taken care of your second company, which had lost almost all of its equipment. Under different circumstances you would have been court-martialed, but let's drop the matter because we appreciate your personal behaviour. This reproach was only partly justified. Of course, the task of the commander of an anti-tank division was not to fight as an infantry unit, but this time the case was quite different. That's why I couldn't stand it. Mr. Lieutenant Colonel, I reject this reproach. Our area is so large that I was in no way able to lead the whole division. Wire and radio communications were disrupted. Twelve guns of the second company were spread over five kilometres. How could I command if the company commander had no such capability? What could an anti-tank officer even do if the infantrymen were running and the tankers were abandoning their tanks? Our division was just running. You can put me on trial by court-martial. I will be able to explain why the material part was lost. Lieutenant Colonel did not answer anything. The general, putting his hand on my shoulder, remarked fails I calm down, Windsor. Everything is all right. The general then offered me a glass of cognac. Here, yeah, drink it first. It's a real Napoleon from the Christmas ration, the best French hot drink there is. Prosit, my good man. Hmm, to your health, Mr. General. That day I decided never to do anything else without orders, to become an executive officer. It seemed to me at the time that I had made a decision of cardinal importance. But what was its value? Did it lead to a fundamental change in my behaviour? The bitter impressions of the past year, the consciousness that the Soviet civilian population was being subjected to bloody repression, the sense of responsibility for this insane campaign, all these experiences did not lead to the result to which the insult to my instilled sense of honour had led. I doubted my soldierly ideal, but that is precisely why these doubts did not lead to any results. They were not an incentive to finally reflect on what was going on. I had broken with those views which constituted the content of my life, but I had not broken with the enemies of the German people. I was still, and it must be admitted, their obedient tool. The year 1944 came. The days rushed by, and we continued to flee under the onslaught of the Red Army troops pursuing us. Now it was no longer our tanks, but the Soviet tanks that were cutting in and flanking our divisions in a wide manoeuvre and closing a larger or smaller ring of encirclement around us. In those months, the expression became popular among the soldiers. Mer forward, friends, we're going backwards. We marched back, and much was left behind us. We had to blow up tanks for lack of fuel. The Soviet aviation destroyed thousands of vehicles. We rendered our guns unusable for lack of ammunition. Whole batteries remained in place because there were neither vehicles nor horse traction. 
weapons and equipment were abandoned, supply bases and food stores were burned, the wounded were left to their fate, the dead in innumerable numbers were left lying unburied. As soon as Katyusha salvos were heard or someone shouted the tanks have broken through, and panic began. Soldiers abandoned their officers. Quite often the panic started through the fault of the officers and ended in disorderly flight. But the selected sapper units were doing their job. They blew up not only abandoned guns and vehicles, mute witnesses of defeat. The defeated army left behind it other terrible traces, blatant consequences of its actions. Destroyed towns, villages, blown up railway lines, bridges, roads, devastated fields, ruins of bombed, blown up and burnt dwellings, schools, museums, rest houses, power stations and factories. Thus we were fulfilling the order to turn Soviet territory into scorched earth. German troops fled westward in disarray, but we are marked bulletins daily reported fierce defensive fighting and the systematic straightening of the front. As we listened to these war reviews, we often wished that the authors were with us. They would have seen firsthand that the chatter about a planned withdrawal was perceived as a sinister irony. Our general staff clearly no longer had time to make plans at all. The Red Army completely mastered the initiative, was the master of the situation. One day during a meeting of commanders, the general came to the map, and after listening to our reports, Gentlemen, I have just returned from a meeting with Field Marshal von Manstein. Therefore, I can outline the situation in the entire area of operations of Army Group South. What we heard confirmed our fears. Where much reports to such an extent masked the true situation on the Eastern Front, that no man could not understand it. From the characterization given by the general, it became clear that the situation of the German army is very dead. It was necessary to finally stop the retreat of the Wehrmacht in order to prevent disaster. Such a frank confession we have not heard until then. About the possibility of catastrophe we have not been told until now. The general's face turned purple. He said, Manstein has repeatedly suggested to the Führer to pull back the front line. We should have long ago withdrawn to then go on the offensive again. But the Führer ordered us to hold every meter of territory at all costs. Retreat is a court-martial, gentlemen. Major General Kellner looked at us, and as no one dared to say anything, he continued. Contrary to his judgment and contrary to his own conviction, Manstein could not inform us of anything other than Hitler's demand. Hold our positions at all costs. Manstein knows that our divisions have at best half their combat strength. We have been persistently reporting this to him. I don't understand this man anymore. Why doesn't he throw his baton on that bloke's desk? By bloke I meant Hitler, and by baton I meant the marshal's staff. No one in our circle was shocked by the words of the division commander. Now even other zealous admirers of Hitler quite frankly said that, in their opinion, it would be better if the supreme command would be in the hands of professionals. Hitler's commanding skills were exhausted by stubborn orders to stand to the death. Like many of my colleagues, I believed that the army command could still change even this critical situation if it persisted in proving to Hitler the correctness of his point of view, whether Field Marshal von Manstein was able to do so. On this point, opinions differed. Many knew him from the Crimea as a great master of expenditure of manpower. Others saw him as a gifted strategist. I knew him only from the Rikswihar as a battalion commander who, wearing a fake helmet, created the illusion that he shared with his unit all the trials. We should then not have argued about the degree of giftedness or mediocrity of individuals, but should have realized on the basis of our own experience whether this retreat still depended at all on the level of professional or non-professional leadership. We were not our defeats, born of deeper causes. Was it not obvious that we had immeasurably overestimated our strength and underestimated the strength and will to resist of the enemy? The boundless courage of the Soviet border guards, who so impressed us at the beginning of our campaign, who fought and stood to the death. Did not such courage become a more and more significant factor from year to year? What did we fight for? And in the name of what did they fight? How natural these questions seem to us now. But they did not arise in my mind then, nor in the minds of other officers of my circle. Every day was marked by new battles and new defeats. We were retreating to the borders of the Reich. What happened to Sedlitz? The situation had stabilized somewhat. In any case, we had been in the same place for several days, had the opportunity to repair vehicles and hoped that replenishment would arrive. We were to receive new self-propelled guns. But above all, we expected the arrival of good radio gunners and mechanics, tank drivers. 
I was standing under the shower when my liaison handed me the order received over the radio to report to the division commander. Shower, it sounds loud, that was the invention of our soldiers. An empty patrol barrel was tied at a height of two meters to trees. Bells were punched in the bottom of the barrel in advance. Several buckets of warm water were poured into the barrel and a shower was obtained. What a pleasure it was for someone who had not undressed for weeks. I went to headquarters. The general received me in his room, in a clean mountain room of a peasant's house, which the soldiers of the headquarters had equipped in a practical and comfortable way. You were formerly in the 12th Infantry Division, and know General von Siedlitz Gersbach. That's right. Herr General, I know him very well. Now very well. General von Seidlitz was very well respected and liked here. He knew every officer by name. When he came to the front line, he never missed an opportunity to visit me. He knew how much I needed a smoke, and he would bring me a packet of cigarettes. No. Did General Seidlitz ever express his opinion about the war, command, or anything like that? No, General Seidlitz was very correct, restrained and precise in his expressions. Windsor read this. This is supposedly signed by General von Seidlitz. The text is certainly not by him, of that I am convinced. Major General Kellner handed me the leaflet. It was a proclamation of the National Committee Free Germany. It called on German soldiers to lay down their arms. Hitler was called a traitor to the German people, a criminal. Among the signatures on the proclamation were several famous names, including von Seidlitz. Uh, General, by the way, I have a small certificate of awarding me the Iron Cross of the First Degree. I received it from General von Seidlitz. It would be good to compare signatures. We ordered the liaison to deliver the letter and establish the coincidence of the stroke and the signature. The General kept comparing and comparing, twirled the paper in his hands, looked at me, and said in such a tone as if he wanted to impress upon me that I should confirm the justice of his words. Oh, nonsense. The signature can be forged. It is quite impossible that Seedlitz could be in league with the Bolsheviks. I can't imagine that, General. That's exactly what I wanted you to say, dear Windsor. You don't think he's dreaming of a second Tarragon, do you? Seedlitz was forced to sign. No, Herr General. I don't think so. Our division commander is not the kind of man who can be forced to do anything. No, he certainly wouldn't allow it. I said our division commander because I still felt connected to the 12th Infantry Division from Schwerin. Major General Kellner let it pass his ears and remark. But then there is something behind all this. Have you heard any details about this National Committee yet? Some, Herr General. Some soldiers brought me a leaflet once. It was a Christmas message, very cleverly put together. The text was good, but the impact was negligible because Christmas was long gone. I heard from others in casual conversation that a committee had been set up, and that it seemed to include many officers who had surrendered in Stalingrad and two former communist members of the Reichstag, Peek and Ulbricht, and, in addition, several writers whose names I have forgotten. I don't know anything else, Her General. Hmm, true. It coincides with what we know. I have spoken to one of our regimental commanders. He knows one of the signatories, a certain Colonel Steidel, from some courses. Besides, Major Leverenz and the Communist Ulbricht, mentioned by you, as if from the Russian trenches, addressed a speech to our infantrymen. I can't imagine General von Seidlitz taking part in that. It's impossible. Nothing is impossible, nothing. You didn't live through the Stalingrad cauldron, my dear. I can easily imagine the mood of commanders who have been in the cauldron and now find themselves in captivity. It was a big mistake not to take back the Sixth Army. It would still have been possible to break through, but the attempt was made only when the opportunity was actually lost. But allow me, Herr General, the Sixth Army was given the task of tying up the Russians while the situation on the Southern Front stabilized. We stood at that time near Leningrad and admired the Stalingraders. It was clear to us that we would have held out the same way if we had found ourselves in a similar position. Do you still think so? Yes, Herr General, those battles must have had some meaning. That's just it, Windsor. And don't preach to me from the Wehrmacht bulletins. You have nothing to pretend before me. Of course, the Sixth Army has held off considerable Russian forces, but it's also got itself in the clutches of the devil. Now we lack it here. That's what's decisive. Here she would fulfil her tasks, and her fighting would... After a pause, during which he again looked at the leaflet, the division commander continued. However, the gentlemen of this committee are making one mistake. 
that they are waging a furious campaign against our command, this I can still understand. They believe they have been sold out, but the fact that they are urging a defection to the enemy is foolish. To end the war, so be it for me, but not here, but in the West. We have to defeat the Bolsheviks or we have to run away. How am I to understand it, General? We must stop the war in the West, or we won't last long here. We have tanks, but not enough men, and sometimes we have to blow up vehicles because we have no fuel. We have fuel, but not enough ammunition, and the Russians are getting stronger every day. Damn it knows how they managed to use all their industry again. The general stared into space. Then he poured us each a glass of brandy. What's the mood of the soldiers? Do you think that such leaflets will have any effect on them? Hey, it's impossible to look into everyone's soul, Mr. General. In general, they grumble more often and louder now than before, but they don't rebel, and I don't think anyone is capable of defecting to the Russians. You think so? That the soldiers are afraid of being shot in the back of the head? Of course, because they want to survive. You see, my dear, that's the point. The soldiers leave their positions as soon as the Russians open fire. It costs us a lot of trouble to stop them. What happens if, under the influence of these leaflets and the propaganda, the Russians are putting out over loudspeakers, they get the idea that they can run forwards instead of backwards. If the soldiers decide that the prisoners are still alive on the other side, what? Hmm. Permission to speak frankly? Of course, that's why I invited you here. Our old soldiers are tired, and yet they can be relied upon. Some companies, if they were without an Oberefreya, would become a herd. The young recruits come to us without the same enthusiasm as in the past. Discipline is weakened. Everyone still does his job, but without enthusiasm. I can see it in myself. True, I still believe today that we will win. I just don't know how, and I don't feel like thinking about it. I'm just tired, Mr. General. Nonsense. Something else is going on with you. You've been in the infantry and you feel out of place with us. You have a problem with the chief of operations. I know that. But, my dear, don't lose heart. Let's have a drink. Hmm. Cheers, Mr. General. Don't tell anyone about our conversation. Understand? There was a pause, during which Major General Kellner was again reading the leaflet. At times he shook his head. Suddenly he asked a new quest. Now is the commander of the first company, Oberlutnant Dew, behaving? Very well, here, General. Hmm. Could he take over your division? Yes because he had already commanded it after the death of my predecessor and until my arrival. That's right. I'd forgotten about that. By the way, how are you feeling? I heard from Dr. Haberman the other day that you're having complications. I've already had surgery once. Dr. Haberman finds I have a suppuration in my maxillary cavity. Listen, darling. I'm going on holiday the day after tomorrow. It looks like the Russians are going to leave us alone here for a while. The chief of operations will be in charge of the division. If I leave you both here, there'll be scandals. Why don't you get along? The chief of operations found out from my personnel file that I'd been reprimanded in the recruitment department. He probably thought I was a stubborn man. Well, you're really a decent bastard. You're Berliner, I'm Prussian, and these gentlemen are from Lower Saxony. You have different personalities. Listen, come with me and get well. Agreed. I didn't think long. I wanted to avoid a confrontation with the head of the operations department, and I needed treatment. Therefore, my so true followed so quickly and sounded so happy that the general laughed. The story of Zietlitz and the National Committee did not get out of my head. I could no longer rid myself of the impression that the drafters of the leaflets were right when they asked why and for what reason we were at war, but on the other hand, I felt that it was impossible to simply stop fighting. Nor could I form any idea of the kind of German democratic state that the leaflets spoke of. In the Weimar Republic I had become disillusioned. I no way wished for a return to similar conditions. I placed my bet on National Socialism. With this new order I pinned my hopes for a better future for my fatherland, but I was disgusted by the methods of the Nazi Party and its interference in all spheres of life. Hitler, however, remained an exception, probably. The fact that as supreme commander of the Wehrmacht, he was my superior, and I believed that I was obliged to obey and remain loyal to him under all circumstances, played a significant role. Although I was annoyed by the false reports of the Wehrmacht, and the ridiculous orders of the Führer's headquarters often angered me, 
Still, the accusations contained in the leaflets aroused my inner resistance. Hitler is a criminal, and this war is a disgrace to Germany. No, it wasn't. True, I no longer believed in a complete final victory, but I hoped that a tolerable outcome of the war was possible, but not a defeat, in the extreme case. Thus, I continue to obediently follow orders. It is indicative of my mood at the time that I so willingly agreed to the divisional commander's proposal to go for treatment. I took with me a valet who had not been on holiday for a year and a half. It took us three days until we finally got on the holiday train in Debrecen, which travelled through Budapest to Vienna. There our paths diverged. The general went to Hanover, and I went to Kohlberg to the hospital where I was operated on. An assassination attempt, four in Bright Hospital Room, we were six officers. Four infantrymen, one sailor and an overlieutenant of the medical service from the parachute troops. The lieutenant captain came from a shore battery in France. This was the area where the Americans and British landed on 6 June 1944. Oberlieutenant Medical Officer Doc Klaas came from a divisional medical station on the French Atlantic coast. The lieutenant captain had been wounded on the first day of the invasion and Doc Klaas on the 6th. It was clear from their accounts that something terrible was going on there because the enemy completely dominated the air. The naval officer believed that the British and Americans could still be thrown into the sea. Doc Tayas held a different opinion, which he expressed quite clearly, namely that the Western Allies would soon be on the Rhine. I was more interested in events on the Eastern Front, where the Russians, supporting the invasion in the West, had launched a major offensive, regained Minsk, Vilna, Grodno, and vast territories in the South. The situation for Germany was developing very badly. The lieutenant captain was becoming more and more restrained in his forecasts. We three infantrymen did not agree with either the lieutenant commander or Dr. Clares. We thought that it would be most expedient to conclude an armistice in the West and to transfer the divisions freed there as quickly as possible to the Eastern Front in order to stop the advance of the Red Army. The chief physician of the infirmary, Dr. Pree, a small, unassuming lieutenant colonel of medical service in the reserves, was renowned as an excellent surgeon. His hospital was impeccably orderly and perfectly clean. If time permitted, Dr. Pree would sometimes linger in the room for a few minutes to listen to our opinions on the situation or to observe a game of chess between Doc Clyers and me. He was usually most eager to talk about his work before the war, his family, his music and books. Maybe he wanted only one thing, to be able to return to a peaceful life again as soon as possible. He was evasive in answering our questions, but once he remarked, Observe sometime just an hour how I operate. Look at the maimed people who are brought here, and then you will know how I feel about war. One day he came into our ward unusually early. It was 21 July 1944. The doctor closed the door and said, This time, it seemed to me, with a slight triumphant grin, an assassination attempt was made on Hitler yesterday, in the headquarters at Wolf Shams. We jumped up and shouted at each other. Hmm, tell us what happened. We waited with tense attention for an answer. Our doctor could not limit himself to a brief report, could he? Mutual distrust and fear of denunciation were so strong that neither of us risked even a single word to give away our hidden thoughts. Perhaps it was not so, but I felt that the slight grin on the lips of the lieutenant colonel of the medical service disappeared when he spoke again in the electrified silence. Hey, the Fuhrer is alive. He was only wounded. It was an officer's conspiracy. The perpetrator of the assassination attempt was captured in Berlin and immediately shot. So Hitler is alive and nothing has changed. It did not escape my attention that the chief physician first said Hitler, and then said Führer, a subtle distinction, indicative of the reaction of all of us to what had happened. It is possible that at the first moment, being in a state of near shock, each of us in our hearts reacted differently to what had happened, but now we were back on track. The possibility of hearing the true opinion of another person for once had passed, but at the same time the danger of compromising ourselves by speaking too hastily about the events had also passed. Only Oberlutnant of the medical service Dr. Kleas dared to take the risk when he reconstructed the course of events again and again. Quite skillfully, however, and each time came to the conclusion that it was, in fact, Incomprehensible how the Führer had been saved so happily. So deeply did the doctor go into all the circumstances that it seemed to us that he was secretly condemning the assassins for not using a more powerful bomb or gun. 
but catching a perplexed glance from any of us, he would end his tirade with the phrase, Yes, Providence saved the fewer for us. Dr. Cleus and I became friends. We played chess, walked in the hospital garden, took walks with his Swedish wife in the streets or on the beach. Sometimes in the evening we sat in the wine cellar at the Kohlberg Town Hall with a bottle of wine, which the owner brought us from his special stock. Sometimes I had a conversation about the events of 21 July with a reserve captain from the 12th Division, a lawyer by profession. One day I asked IT, what would have happened now if the Fuhrer had fallen victim to an assassination attempt? It did not happen. So any further discussion is unnecessary, the lawyer replied. At that he grinned in a friendly manner. Of course he was right. But our conversations on the subject continued. No. Who do you think would have succeeded the Fuhrer? It's hard to say. Under certain circumstances there could have been a rivalry between the successor candidates, since the Fuhrer's deputy Rudolf Hess is in England. I doubt that things would go well. I am certainly not one of those who accept everything 100%. But firstly, as a lawyer, I reject assassination as a matter of principle. A change of government, and even in time of war, can only be approved if someone more acceptable comes to power. But what kind of enterprise was this that some major Raymer with one battalion could put an end to? And what was Herdler, who was fleeing on foot from pursuit and was caught by some liaison woman along with one policeman? That brunette got a million for his head, though. Hmm, how do you think things will go from here? I believe that the few who will use these new weapons at the very last minute, before the Russians or Americans cross our borders. That's how many conversations ended. We hoped for a miracle. We simply could not imagine that all the efforts and sacrifices made would be in vain. But I could not get the statement of the National Committee Free Germany out of my head. After all, it included German officers. After some thought, I initiated a petition to send me to the front, before the end. After recovery, Doc Clayers took charge of one of the hospital wards. I went to see him. Uli, I'm well and I want to go to the front again. See to it that I'm discharged. Don't be silly. You're not well. What do you want there on the front line to win? My dear doctor, you know as well as I do that I'm not ill. Write a note, please do me a favour. Don't you realise that? It's pointless. Be glad I can hide you here. Do you want your skull to be blown off in the last few days? Life here has become unbearable for me. Wherever I go, wherever I stay, there's grouchiness everywhere. Every other person asks me if I still believe in the final victory. And what does ultimate victory mean? The Russians are at our doorstep. We must stop them at the border. We have to stop the Americans too. Don't you realize that? No. Don't you think the war will stop at the border? You're only helping to delay the end. What if the miracle weapons don't make it? Listen, you are our wonder weapon. You are one of those who are not used to thinking and think they have to do their so-called duty. The other wonder weapons are the very young boys of the Hitler Youth who dream of heroism and the Knight's Cross, as well as the old boys who took part in the First World War and who are now being put back into military uniforms. We should not forget those who complain all the time, stay in the asylum all night and then go back to work in the morning. We are all that miracle weapon. Even if you're thrice right, Yuli, I still want to go to the front. Be honest, because I belong in the category of fit for wartime service. Officers have already returned to the front with one arm or a prosthetic leg. Get me out of the infirmary. After all, it's really my duty, you must realize. You're hopeless. Go, God be with you. You'll get jaundice soon. I can see it in your eyes. Wait another week, won't you? No. A suit yourself, I wish you success. You're really hopeless. After a short telephone conversation with the personnel office of the Army General Command in Berlin, I was assigned. Officer losses were very high, and there were plenty of vacant command posts. I was to take over an artillery division on the Eastern Front. A week later, I reported to the 551st Infantry Division near Tilsit. After another week, I noticed the first signs of jaundice. This, however, soon passed, but the beginning of my service was fraught with great disappointment. The infantry division was supposed to be supplied with new weapons, but in reality everything looked different. My unit had only two companies, one with 12 anti-tank guns and one with self-propelled anti-aircraft guns. The third company was still being formed. It was to receive self-propelled artillery guns. 
Only the anti-aircraft company was manned. The company of anti-tank guns had only one tractor for three guns. The division headquarters had a few motorbikes and cars, but the much-needed drivers still had to be trained. When they graduated from the driver's school, a shortage of petrol was discovered, and the cars were converted to wood gas. The cars were fitted with the kind of gas pumps used in bathrooms. The wood for the gas was supplied by East Prussian furniture factories. It was necessary to heat up the gas stove an hour before starting the engine, which was impossible in case of an alert. I decided to use my acquaintance with the logistics officer, who was in charge of supplying the anti-tank units, and through him organized the receipt of vehicles and guns. To make my plan a success, on the advice of the intendant of the division, I took with me from the military shop a box of suitable goods, a schnapps and cigarettes. This sesame had its effect, and in Berlin I was promised that within a week I would be able to take the machines I needed to Brandenburg. From Berlin I went to Kohlberg, hoping to get through the manning department the missing specialists. Drivers, radio operators and gunners. I was given volunteers. One team of drivers I immediately sent to Brandenburg, but I never saw them again, nor did I receive any vehicles in Brandenburg, together with the selected men and Lieutenant Hayes, who, like me, was tired of the fuss in the garrison. I arrived on the Semland Peninsula before the Red Army had finally closed the ring of encirclement. Killer's orders were to hold the Zemland Peninsula at all costs. Galita Koch was directly in charge of this endeavour. There was a mixture of Wehrmacht and Nazi party competence, grey and brown threads intertwined. Up to that time we had received orders from Army Group Headquarters and from the Corps. Now orders with the force of an order began to come from the steel bunker of the Gauleiter of East Prussia, and posters with appeals and veiled threats were pasted on the walls of houses. Rumours soon spread that military field courts were sentencing officers and soldiers, and the field gendarmerie or SS men were hanging them. To discuss the coordination arrangements necessary for the defence of Zemland, our corps commander called a meeting of unit commanders at the end of November 1944. It was expected that Goliata Koch, some standard ten Führers of the stormtroopers, as well as battalion commanders of the Volkssturm battalions would arrive. Everyone who looked like a man had to put on a patched military uniform, was provided with a fire iron and sent to take part in the defence. Military uniforms were lacking, armbands replaced them, the Volkssturm was armed with guns of all types that had ever been in use since the invention of smokeless gunpowder. However, the role of a miracle weapon was played in the Volkssturm by the fast patron a handheld anti-tank grenade launcher with the help of which teenagers and old men had to stop the advance of the Red Army tank divisions. Representatives of the Volkssturm appeared at the meeting at the Corps Commander's office with the same precision as other commanders. Then the Corps Commander arrived. Representatives of the Volkssturm appeared at the meeting, but still late was Golita Koch and his entourage. We waited for an hour. Then began the meeting, a kind of staff games which were supposed to give us an idea of our combat capabilities. Another ten minutes passed and we heard a convoy of vehicles pulling up, not with gas generators of course, we heard the slamming of car doors. The voices of the newly arrived gentlemen grew louder and louder, and finally the Gauleiter appeared before us, followed by fat bellies in brown uniforms with many stars and badges. As in 1933, when I visited the headquarters of the stormtroopers in Berlin, the whole thing gave the impression of some kind of operetta. Daulita and his entourage raised their hands for the German salute. Quite military, but only an The corps commander bent his right arm slightly at the elbow, which could hardly be considered a response to the greeting. He pointed to several vacant chairs prepared for the gentlemen from the party authorities and continued to direct the meeting. The Gauleiter probably assumed that the assembled commanders of the combat units awaited his arrival with respectful impatience, and that when he, to whom the Führer had entrusted the saviour of East Prussia, finally appeared, he would be greeted with the sound of a military march and hoarse shouts of hail. Meanwhile, we looked at him with curiosity. After all, we had never seen a Gauleiter during the long years of war. We then went back to studying our maps. We had always believed that the course of events at the front was the business of the Wehrmacht. Let the party take care of women and children and everything that total war threatened the homeland. We needed replenishment and miracle weapons, not Gauleiter and Standart in Friera. We took the appearance of these characters at the meeting as an onerous nuisance. The whole thing almost ended in a scandal. 
The alcoholic coach's blistered face poured blood. And it seemed that he was about to shout, but Koch suddenly turned round and, without saying goodbye, left the room with his entourage. The corps commander concluded this interlude with the words. Now where were we? We responded to this apt, questioning remark with loud laughter and continued the staff game as if there had been no interruption. When we returned to our command posts, we immediately set to work to carry out our prescribed activities. I was just drawing up company orders when the field telephone buzzed. Oberfield Feltsbill may handed me the receiver. Er, uh, Capitan, the intendant of the division is at the telephone. This intendant was able to sneak from abandoned establishments a huge amount of writing paper for typewriters, but could not supply our unit with socks for the soldiers. The agitated intendant informed me that a certain representative of the party had made a claim. Oberlieutenant Reinert had ordered a cow to be slaughtered for his company, and this was forbidden. Gorleiter Koch, on the ground that East Prussia should by no means be given up, had suspended the evacuation of the population and forbidden, under threat of punishment, to supply the army with food from local resources. I was well aware of this, but I considered this prohibition completely meaningless, since the centralized army supply was not functioning. I asked a perplexed question. Um, how is it so forbidden? There was silence at the other end of the wire. The intendant had to consult with the golden pheasant, as we called the officials of the Nazi party. Then came the reply. In the interest of supplying the Reich at the end of the war and to ensure the breeding stock, it is necessary to preserve the stock. The gentleman wants to make a report. Hey, Tell him that Oberlulut and Reinert acted on my orders. Soldiers can't go into battle without e The frightened intendant informed me that in that case the gentleman from the party must draw up the protocol together with me. Here I exploded. Let that gentleman have me, if he wants a protocol, let him come to my command post. The industrious official did not respond to my insistent invitation. We were tired of the war, we longed for its end. The question of why, why? was no longer asked, it was replaced by the question, how long would it go on, and this how much longer also contained the original answer to the why. We could hardly see any point in continuing the war any longer. But in order to stop fighting, in order to contribute, contrary to orders and oaths, to a speedy end of the war, we needed a great consciousness, the ability to cope with inner doubts, a determination filled with risk. I was far from such thoughts. Like many of my comrades, I hoped most of all for a miracle, for a new weapon of unheard of power, which would stop the Red Army, which was rushing forward unstoppably, and could destroy it, so that at last we would find peace and the war would end. I did not dare to think that a Red Army victory and the occupation of Germany was possible. So we gathered forces for new battles, although each operation required new sacrifices. In this case, however contradictory it may seem, the sense of self-preservation played an essential role. The fanatics were climbing out of their skins. Their frenzied frenzy was evidenced by officers and soldiers hanging from roadside trees, dead men with shields on their chests, announcing that here was a damned coward who had suffered deserved punishment, while the uniform still bore the insignia for bravery in battle with the enemy. But on the other hand, there were people like our chief of operations, Lieutenant Colonel Baron von Lefelholz, who at the end of one of the meetings said to the commanders, Gentlemen, do your duty as it is expected of you but use your weapons in such a way that as many of your men as possible are brought home with you. It took courage to give such instructions. The fighting and the harsh East Prussian winter demanded extreme effort from the soldiers. In the evenings, when the battle had subsided, the men would fall into the snow and fall asleep, warming each other with their bodies. One day Baron von Leffelholz summoned me to the division headquarters. The general would like to hear the opinion of one of the commanders about the mood of the soldiers. Tell him the whole truth, without any hesitation. Be honest. After listening to me, General Feherein became quite downcast and looked like an empty potato sack. He stared gloomily into space. He probably realized that he would lose his promised estate somewhere in the Eastern Territories and, moreover, his post. I had only told him what my officers had discussed openly enough, some with more and some with less frankness. I summoned them to a meeting every week, if possible considering it my duty, as far as I was able, to keep them informed. I marked the front lines on the map of Europe daily, both on the basis of Wehrmacht reports and BBC London Radio, although it was forbidden under the strictest threat to listen to enemy radio. 
Even greater penalties were threatened for disseminating the information transmitted to them, but we did not reckon with that. We accompanied every time with sarcastic laughter the assurances of our radio that henceforth not a single meter would be surrendered to the enemy. And we laughed even more frankly when the next day we listened to reports about the planned withdrawal of our troops. It was a bitter laugh. Some of us were indignant. They considered the false reports a mockery of desperate soldiers. My chief of staff, a young lieutenant, formerly a petty fuhrer of the Hitler Youth, still believed in Hitler. My adjutant, Lieutenant Berthold, an artist by profession, had been severely wounded several times and had been declared employable for the home front, but he had voluntarily returned to the front. His commander of a staff company was also severely wounded several times and was found fit for service in garrisons at home, but he was disgusted with the situation in garrisons and this prompted him to go with me to an infantry division. The commander of the anti-tank company, Oberlieutenant von Liebenstein, was a quarter Jew, but on the basis of an order from the Führer's Chancellery he was allowed to remain a reserve officer. The commander of the anti-aircraft company, Oberlieutenant Reinert, a convinced National Socialist in his youth, now did not want to hear about his Führer. I, on the other hand, despite my growing antipathy to Hitler, still believed that only he could change the situation. For a long time I had no longer cared about the idea and the fate of Hitler himself. Now it was about the fate of the fatherland. With horror I began to think about what awaited Germany when the war was over. At times I was filled with unbearable indignation when I belatedly reflected on the fact that all these misfortunes could have been avoided. The question tormented me more and more. Why, by what right, did we commit aggression against other countries? The meetings which I convened were almost always attended by platoon commanders, military engineers from the workshops, the doctor and the commander of the anti-tank artillery of the fortified area subordinate to me, Captain Langhoff as well as by Oberfeldfei Belmar, whom we regarded as something like a deputy officer. One day a new officer appeared in our circle. He had just received the cross for military merit. Air Captain, I am attached to your unit for four weeks as a National Socialist Ideological Officer. He introduced himself separately to each of those present, giving his surname and bowing in a manner which he thought was emphatically correct, but in reality looked completely ridiculous. I have forgotten the lieutenant's name, but I have not forgotten how he bowed and what followed. What are your tasks as a National Socialist Ideological Officer? Sir Capitan, this cannot be defined in a few words. Basically, we have to instill confidence in the ultimate victory of the German armory. What kind of weapons are you talking about? The crappy guns we have, for which we almost always lack ammunition and the necessary tractors? I am speaking figuratively, Herr Capitan. I mean the victory of the German cause. And as for the tractors, we don't need them anymore. We will no longer retreat. I can convince the soldiers of that. As you imagine, how will you convince the soldiers? I'll make company reports, Mr. Captain. No, my good man, that won't do any good. When I have to make a report, my commanding officers do it. Are you an artilleryman, by the way? No, Herr Capitan. You see, I can't even use you as a platoon leader, but I can recommend a better occupation. Our intendant is completely inept. You could help him get some decent rations, cigarettes and junk. You have connections, don't you? Go and report your arrival at the convoy. He left, flaming with anger. I watched him gloatingly. I felt my superiority over him, realizing that my harsh frontline experience weighed more heavily than his political pathos. I laughed at the apparent contradiction between theory and practice, but in essence I was not much more perceptive than this ideological officer. The better armament, to which I attached so much importance, was as much incapable of making decisive changes in the course of the war as his false propaganda. We were both fighting for the same crappy cause, doomed to inevitable defeat, and neither of us realized it at the time. Meanwhile, his report of my shamelessness got to Lieutenant Colonel von Lefels. The next instance was the wastebasket. Nevertheless, the SWAT as a sign of warning did not pass me by. Lefels also knew how to speak out firmly and definitely. Ideology officer no longer showed up in my unit. It didn't upset us. On the 13th of January 1945, the Red Army started a new big offensive, and we started to scramble again, with each Russian attack the loop around the cauldron on the Zemland Peninsula was tightened more tightly. Each day brought new heavy losses. It could not go on like this for long. 
we were going to be captured unless the fleet rescued us. Once more we gathered our forces for a counterattack. All available ammunition was put into action, the last remnants of fuel were collected. We made our way forward, and the ring around Koenigsberg was broken for a while. A considerable part of the inhabitants of the town were able to be evacuated. No other result could have been achieved by these last efforts. The Soviet formations responded with strong counterattacks, preceded by intense artillery fire. Our companies were melting away. In this situation, one day a replenishment arrived. Extremely excited, I was about to greet the soldiers, but was confused when I found myself face to face with about 30 boys between the ages of 14 and 16 from the Hitler Youth Union. Along with them arrived a group of older men, almost entirely invalids from the First World War. The boys came from the liquidated camp of the Hitler Youth, where they had been collected from all over the Reich. I quickly accommodated the elderly, sending them to the caravan. But it was more difficult to dispose of the young men. They wanted to fight, to win, and, if necessary, to die for their beloved Führer. At first I used them to guard the wagon. After a few days they began to scandalize, express their discontent in every possible way, and wanted to go to the front line. They dreamed of the Knight's Cross and immortal glory. If I didn't want to give in to their insistence, I had to get rid of them in some way. But I'd hate it if they just ended up in another unit. There they would probably be sent to the front lines. Therefore it was necessary to send them to the rear. This was not difficult to organize. Although the field gendarmerie had set up outposts around Pillow, no one was allowed into the city without a definite official business. Except women, children and the wounded, who were to be evacuated by sea. It was more difficult to convince these young Hitler youths, who were eager to fight, that they were given a special task. Everything else became a mere formality, although it was the formal rules that were broken. For several groups, which I combined with the old men from the Volkssturm and their relatives, I wrote out travelling certificates without having the slightest right to do so. But the Prussians fear nothing but God and a piece of paper with a stamp. Supplied with the documents, the detachments reached the steamer and sailed on board it towards Finimunda. My adjutant watched the whole of this manoeuvre and reported to me that the task had been accomplished. The boys already at sea probably noticed that I had deprived them of the opportunity to go down in history as heroes. I met two of them after the war in Kiel and an old man from the Volkssturm in Hanover. They recognised me in the street. In the time that had elapsed, the young men had managed to understand everything that the old man had already understood in the last weeks of the war. Initially I had tried to conceal my illegal assignments and had counted people who had been sent home as part of the unit, included them in the reports on available personnel and as being on the payroll. However, my deception was discovered when the general thought of inquiring about the success of the young men, their fighting, their behaviour and whether they should be rewarded. Lieutenant Colonel von Leffey Holz again settled the matter. He also disapproved of sending teenagers to the front lines. Unfortunately, the lieutenant colonel was briefly reassigned a few days later and was replaced by one Major Frelich of the general staff, who wanted to use the opportunity to make a name for himself. I had just had a severe attack of jaundice. The divisional doctor, Dr. Walder, insisted on sending me home, but gave in to my entreaties, as he put it, on my own responsibility. There was no medication or diet, but there was pervitin, which was given to commanders and superiors as an extraordinary remedy. Pervitin was a drug that would keep you awake for a few days, after which you would fall into a dead sleep for many hours. Sick of jaundice, I was lying in an abandoned East Prussian peasant's house, in which the adjutant had set up a command post. Through the window I watched what was happening on the section of the front in front of us. The front edge of the defence was about 300 metres from the house. Suddenly Soviet tanks and infantry went on the offensive. After a short but intense artillery fire, our infantry retreated. Slowly a few tanks approached. My small headquarters was unable to hold without the heavy guns that had yet to be pulled up. A single tractor was supposed, shuttling back and forth, to deliver four anti-tank guns. But this... I ordered the acting chief of operations to put me on the phone. Air Major, the Russians are attacking. In front of my command post, about a dozen T-34. 250 to 300 metres away. The infantry is retreating. I can't do anything. I ask permission to move to another position. You stay where you are. Followed by an order. The front edge of the defence is 300 metres away. The infantry is holding the position. 
Besides, I have no reports of Russian tanks from there. I resented it. This major imagines that sitting there in front of his maps, he can better than me to survey the situation when before my eyes boiling battle. I couldn't stand it any longer and I shout, Sir Major, I'm informing you of what I see. The infantry retreated without informing you about the Russian tanks. They have already approached 150 meters. I'm moving to another position. You stay where you are. Mm, come here if you don't believe me. I don't intend to let myself be crushed. That was the last thing I said to the Chief of Operations. Perhaps the most terrible rumble reached his ears. At that very moment, a Russian shell crashed through the window, struck the opposite wall, made a huge hole there and filled the room with lime dust. My adjutant, Oberfelfig Bill May and the liaison officer, covered from head to foot with lime dust, looked like sacks of flour. Communication was broken. Then we heard the rumble of the tracks of approaching Soviet tanks and the hurrah of the accompanying infantry. Behind our house stood two well-camouflaged vehicles with their engines running. Oberfeldfeld Bell may have taken care of that. We sped away to the accompaniment of the Russian guns. Hiding behind a small hillside, we moved towards the division command center. Suddenly the driver braked and pointed to the motorway where a passenger car was rushing towards the Russians. We started waving our hands to warn of the danger, but this sign was not noticed. Are they either completely mad or are they running towards the Russians? Said my driver. These days we were hearing more and more often about individual soldiers or small groups running to the other side. But it had not happened yet that such actions were taken so openly. With intense attention we watched the rushing vehicle. They should have thrown out the white flag by now, for Soviet tanks were around the corner, and then disaster struck. The car skidded, it hit a tree, and caught fire. Then a shot rang out. A shell tore off the roof of the car. No one got out. It was burning brightly. At division headquarters, I learnt that Major Frelich had sent two officers to check the accuracy of my report. Now I had the opportunity to personally explain to him the situation. However, he still refused to believe me, blurted out something about panic and weak nerves, and was even close to ordering me to return to my command post when suddenly several shells rained down on the small village. The tanks that were pursuing us attacked the village. The fleeing relocation of the division headquarters was not an attractive sight. A flock of excited geese would not have made more noise than this bunch of liaisons, clerks and officers' clerks, who received at least 30 different orders from 10 chiefs. The clerks were saving their files, the liaison officers their vodka, the radio operators their equipment, and the messmen their offices' luggage. But all of them, and above all the gentlemen at headquarters, were saving their precious lives. The Major, who'd had recently held himself so self-confidently, now no longer had time to listen to my report. The strategist's face contorted with a grimace. He took a step towards the door, and in a few leaps was in his car in which he sped away from the village. We rejoiced when shortly afterwards Lieutenant Colonel von Nefelfels resumed his post as Chief of Operations. During this panic withdrawal of the division headquarters, calmness and equanimity were preserved by only one officer. Captain Stilter, adjutant to the general. He came up to me, held out his hand and said smiley. You see, we're in a bit of a hurry now. Try to hold out here at least. By the way, we've presented you for promotion. I think we'll soon be able to honour the Major. At first I was happy to receive the news. I took it uncritically and was proud of the recognition of my soldierly merits, as if it all happened in a politically no man's land. True. I had a vague idea of how the petition of the division headquarters would get to Berlin, and how the order to produce me would catch up with me on the Zemland Peninsula. Ominous forebodings possessed us as we fought in the cauldron for every inch of land, while the Red Army was already approaching Berlin, and the Western Allies had crossed the Rhine. Day after day we surrendered all new frontiers, day after day soldiers died in hastily equipped new positions. So we had to cut the front line again. There was a temporary lull. The Soviet tanks had withdrawn, they no doubt needed to refuel and stock up on ammunition. I advanced behind the last division headquarters vehicles to the outskirts of the village where I met Oberleutnant Reinert and his company. The self-propelled vehicles and guns were sheltered under trees or pushed into courtyards. The commander and his soldiers camped in a roadside ditch around a camp radio. As I approached, I heard the honeyed voice of the Minister of Propaganda delivering one of his speeches about the need to hold out at all costs. I didn't need to give Reinert detailed instructions. 
He was aware of the situation and had already received his assignment from the operations chief who was passing by. Doubles was still ranting. Suddenly Reinert turned round abruptly, jabbed the receiver furiously with his foot and shouted in terrible anger. Shut up at last. Come to the front. Then you'll see what's really going on. The soldiers standing around grinned approvingly. But then something completely unexpected happened. Obelishant Reinhardt gave the order, the men rushed to the cars and guns, and the company moved into battle to stop the Russian vanguard. Reinhardt was in the lead. More and more narrowed the cauldron on the Zemland Peninsula. At some points whole companies threw down their weapons and ran over to the Russians. The remnants of our division were pushed behind Pillow to a narrow spit where it was impossible to hide from Soviet air raids and in the dunes it was impossible to equip any positions. Soviet bombers based at Braunsberg and Heligenbühl flew across the estuary and dropped their bombs on well-defined targets, returned to load up, and bombed us again without respite. It was, I think, the 1st of May, when I was summoned to the division headquarters, where the chief of the operations department briefly outlined the situation. It was necessary to pull back the remnants of our units as quickly as possible and load them on a military ferry. Barn to Gay. Order was received by radio from Berlin to relocate to Denmark, where the division would be restaffed. At that moment, all I could think of was that there was an opportunity to get out of this hell. The manning would last for months, and the endeavor hardly made any sense at all, and it was not possible that the headquarters in Berlin would count on the fact that the war could still go on for so long. Denmark meant above all rest. The next day before evening, the ferries finally appeared at the shore. They were filled to the brim with the remnants of our division so that the ferries, let the sailors forgive me the unprofessional expression, up to their necks in water. In the pre-dawn twilight, following the minesweeper, they set off, heading for Denmark. Behind us on the horizon were the glow of fires and artillery salvos. For a while we could still hear the muffled explosions, and then we heard only the crash of the waves against the ship's side and the tapping of the engines. On the road, all talk was about the radio report, that the Fuhrer had fallen at the front, near Berlin. They also talked about the formation of a new government headed by Admiral Donitz, who among us at that time still honoured Hitler, believed in him or even loved him. But I did not hate him because he ruthlessly demanded that we sacrifice our lives, even though it was clearly just an attempt to delay the inevitable end. But in my mind, everything that was happening was somehow connected to Hitler, and now he no longer existed. It is possible that some of us rejoiced in our hearts. It is also certain that many of us thought that now we could expect something new, but everyone remained silent, even those who had previously scolded Hitler. He fell in battle alongside his soldiers, as reported on the radio. We could not imagine his death any other way. When I later learnt of his marriage to Eva Braun in the Imperial Chancellery and his suicide, I began to hate and despise him. My myth had been shattered. The total defeat of the German army caused us to lose faith in our nation and in ourselves. We were incapable of any expression of our feelings, neither to shriek to free ourselves from their burden, nor to laugh to lighten our souls. A frightful silence surrounded us, and this oppressive emptiness could not be filled by the usual orders. Each was left to himself. Five minutes after midnight. During the crossing we did not see a single Soviet aircraft. The servants of the anti-aircraft batteries were dozing. No one could say what, in fact, had happened. Radio information, which from the minesweeper was transmitted by mouthpiece from ferry to ferry, did not bring any clarity. It was reported that the army on the Zemland Peninsula had surrendered, but that the home front boon continued. In Bavaria and in Schleswig-Holstein there was successful resistance. Then came the news that in the West the fighting had ceased, and that the divisions liberated there were being transferred to the east. Some officers were discussing plans to reform our division quite seriously. Others, including myself, thought that the war was over. We were preoccupied with the question of what profession we would now choose. Some crazy Lieutenant Liaison officer from the artillery tried to stage a morning rally in memory of the Fuhrer, but only a group of soldiers responded to his call. We looked like a band of brigands in uniform, dirty and overgrown like savages. At last land appeared on the horizon. It was evidently the Danish island of Bornholm. Indeed, we approached the harbour of Rona. At last we were able to disembark from the ferry, which had to be fuelled in order to go back and ferry the next parties. 
That same evening, a large vessel, which the chief of operations had obtained for us, set a course for Copenhagen. We were afraid of running into mines, so we changed course frequently. When we finally entered the harbour of the Danish capital, we heard sirens wailing. Danish and British flags were flying at the windows and on the roofs of buildings, as our ship moored. We exchanged news with the soldiers gathered on the quay. Mercy seemed to ease. Peace, shouted to us from the quay. Nurse Abbeth, we've all been interned in the harbour. Where did you come from? Hitler shot himself. They're sending us to Canada as prisoners. You too. Berlin's in a pincer, it's on fire. Hitler escaped by aeroplane to Argentina or Spain. We'll be restaffed, and there with the Americans against the Russians. These exclamations came to us from all sides. It was as if we were thrown a lot of colourful balls. We picked them up and sent them on. At last the order was given to disembark and line up on the quay. In only a few minutes the division, that is, its pitiful remnant, numbering about 800 men, was lined up in three rows on the breakwater. Two English officers, dressed smartly, walked slowly along the front, starting on the left flank. They were accompanied by a number of soldiers with linen baskets. They took marching compasses and binoculars from all the non-commissioned officers and officers. An indescribable anger seized me, until a few days ago we had fought against the Red Army, and it had defeated us. That was undeniable. But these here? I did not regard the British as victors. Thinking briefly, I took a few steps forward, ripped off my binoculars and, swinging them wide, threw them into the water. Then I returned to my seat. This demonstration did not go unnoticed by the Englishmen. They came towards me. One of them had evidently lost an arm in the battle. He had many insignia on his breast. No doubt he had fought in battles in Africa or in France. He looked at me hard and coldly, said not a word and went on his way. Apparently he understood my behaviour, and suddenly he became sympathetic to me, though it made me angry that he showed no irritation. I could not suppose that we were yet to be needed. We encamped in the harbour of Copenhagen, in the large packing houses in which bananas and other cargoes were usually stored. The day of dispatch soon came. From the army units interned in the harbour, marching columns were formed, divided into units, each with a company or battalion. At our prescribed slow pace we trickled south. We were armed with our light firearms, commanded by German officers, directed and supplied by the British. Along the column, between the echelons, jeeps were travelling back and forth with British officers watching the progress of our formations. We camped, having covered only 10 to 20 kilometres during the day, as in a march in a military setting, a guard was posted. Passing through towns, we firmly stamped our step tightened rifle belts and demonstrated military order in front of the Danish anti-fascists, who probably assumed that after the total defeat of Hitler's Germany, the situation would be different for a few days. At Corsor, the Danish ferry took the echelons across the Great Belt. When we finally crossed the Danish-German border north of Flensburg after a march of many days, we were met there by British officers. They greeted us in an almost friendly manner. In those days they treated with full confidence the legend about the forthcoming resumption of hostilities against the Red Army. There was chatter as if the defeated German divisions would be reorganized to march with the Western Allies. We believed that there would be a war between the Western powers and the Soviet Union, but most of us were of the opinion that in that case the Germans should stay out of it. Still, there were many among us who were ready, after a short rest, to march again against the Russians. I was not among them, but not so much because I rejected such an insidious conspiracy from the political point of view as for personal reasons. I was in dire need of rest. I was thoroughly fed up with this unfortunate war. It was late at night when, after nearly six years of war, we entered German soil. I looked at the luminous face of my wristwatch, which I had received from the Wehrmacht in 1939 for official use. The watch showed exactly five minutes after midnight. I had that watch with me all the years of the war. After the attack on Poland, the days when I dreamed that I would participate in the war effort quickly passed. When we threw the western rampart went to war against France, we platoon commanders check the time by our watches. On this clock I looked with increasing excitement before giving my company the signal to violate the Soviet border. Before each attack, the oppressive moments of tense anticipation and fear counted down too quickly. But with the hurricane fire, the minutes dragged agonizingly slowly. Each time we retreated, 
We watched with relief as the movement of the clock hand brought us closer to the moment when we could surrender a position that could no longer be held. The clock had governed our every move, right up to the escape, right up to the moment of save who you can, when time had lost its meaning. Now the clock showed five minutes after midnight, but time had not stopped, and the hands of the clock continued their run. Homeland? Our echelons were diverted by detours past Flensburg. The destination was to be some kind of camp. There were various opinions about it. There was talk of an assembly point, a training camp, maybe a prisoner of war camp, or even a concentration camp. In any case, they would not send armed men to an educational institution. It caught our eye that just at the place where we had made a halt, three cars had stopped, from which two German generals with adjutants and entourage got out and began to confer. They had maps in their hands. We rested in a roadside ditch, admired the rising sun, inhaled the air of the warm June morning, and at last we could again serenely and attentively follow the flight of birds that were passing over the zeros. There was a wholesome, yet somehow frightening silence all around. I still did not feel safe, as if I expected a diving aircraft to suddenly fire machine guns and drop bombs on us. It just seemed implausible that one could lie here on one's back like this, and not have to rush to the nearest shelter to escape the hail of shells and seek shelter from the screeching shrapnel. It was a great pleasure to watch the smoke of a cigarette, to lie down and rest, to stretch out my legs after all the trials and enjoy the peace and quiet. But the thought that many friends and comrades had not lived to see this day tormented me. What did they give their lives for? In the name of what have we marched and fought? It would be immodest to say that I had already found a satisfactory answer to all these questions. I only imagined that these hundreds of thousands of people could have been kept alive if the war had been stopped earlier. At least by the time it became obvious that the war could not be won, and even more, that millions of casualties could have been avoided if the war had been started at all. I stretched out on the grass, overwhelmed by the infinitely wonderful feeling of being able to live without fear. But the generals who had arrived made me uneasy. It seemed that some orders were being given. The adjutants stood at attention, straight as candles, and put their hands to their visors whenever the generals addressed them. Together with two other travelling companions, I lazily moved closer to the group. So as not to attract attention, we pretended to be engaged in the sort of business that one would not put in the mind of a soldier during a halt. We halted at the corner of a house, and were thus able to look round absent-mindedly and listen. It was about the location of the headquarters of two corps somewhere in Schleswig-Holstein. The town of Plen was mentioned, and there was talk of orders to be drawn up by the adjutants and submitted for approval. That was enough for me. I did not want to deal with any more orders of any kind. I therefore decided simply to desert, though I regarded it as a monstrous act, remembering my long service in the army. Nevertheless, I decided not to go with the train to one of the camps, but to hide in Flensburg, where my wife, my son, my sister-in-law and my wife's parents lived. They found three rooms with the help of an officer they knew and moved there, taking with them the few belongings they had kept from Kohlberg. This address was already mentioned in the letters I received with the last field mail in East Prussia. I married in Kohlberg two years before the war. The first two years of this marriage I spent mainly on the training ground and on manoeuvres, and the remaining years on the European battlefields, apart from stays in hospitals and on leave. Now, however, having sneaked by various tricks past the British posts, I stood before my wife no longer as a hero in a military uniform who had made a career and a position in society, but as an escaped prisoner of war in patched trousers. The young soldier who had once danced merrily in uniform or plain clothes had turned into a sullen man at a dead end in life, seeking something but unable to explain what he wanted. Eventually our marriage fell apart like thousands of other such marriages. I was left with nothing but my military uniform, but no one asked me where I came from or where I was going as I wandered the streets of Flensburg. However, there were notices on the walls of houses and on fences demanding the surrender of all weapons. Possession of weapons was punishable by firing squad, and warning that it was forbidden to leave the houses after dark, and imprisonment was expected for violations. It became clear to me that I could no longer wear my uniform, so I tried to buy material for a civilian suit from one of the Wehrmacht warehouses. The warehouse was under the control of an intendant whose Prussian stubbornness was boundless. He refused to fulfil my request, and assured me that he had given all the stocks to the British. He even appealed to my convictions as a German officer, 
who in fact should have realized that one cannot simply cut off a three-meter piece of cloth here. He was clearly shocked when I called him a complete idiot and a pacoist. Nevertheless, I got the cloth. As a result, I continued to walk around in my uniform. Later, I learned that from this incorruptible intendant, much could be bought for cigarettes or other scarce goods, or at enormously inflated prices. The British soon confiscated the warehouse, and the blundering bureaucrat was imprisoned, as he was unable to explain how he came to have huge sums of money hidden under his bed. My situation was very unenviable. A soldier without a duty station, I was between heaven and earth, and without a discharge certificate I couldn't get a job. I could eventually go to an army camp, but I was not willing to do so. No one could explain to me what was actually going on there. I only learnt that there were really two corps. Often I saw German officers in full uniform travelling around in their official cars, and the drivers opening the car doors for them and saluting them with a youthful poise that was no longer observed by soldiers in the last months of the war. It looked as if the Wehrmacht was getting back on its feet, but I preferred not to deal with it. I wished to be at last a free man and master of my own destiny. One day I was wandering aimlessly down the street again, my thoughts occupied with an uncertain future. Suddenly a British jeep pulled up beside me. An officer and two soldiers jumped out of the car, blocked my way, grabbed me by both hands, threw me like an empty duffel bag into the back seat of the car, and drove off with me. The whole incident lasted a few seconds. When I came to my senses after the unexpected shock, I asked what it all meant. A reply in German followed. You are under arrest. I could have guessed this without any explanation. But all other questions were met with silence. We were speeding through the narrow streets of Flensburg. In the jeep I was haunted by the irresistible sweet smell of English cigarettes. I almost vomited. It had been a long time since I had had enough to eat, and I was also filled with an incomprehensible fear. Suddenly the car braked so sharply that I almost fell out of my seat. We stopped in front of a large brick building. A revolver. The cell in the Flensburg prison was no more comfortable than the one in which I, as a non-commissioned officer, had spent three days of strict arrest. The furnishings consisted of wooden bunks, a stool, a hanging shelf, and a tin bowl for washing. A faint light came in through a grated window in the ceiling, and a sentry peered through the peephole in the door every fifteen minutes to make sure that the guest was not yet bursting with indignation. When I was arrested, I was wearing the uniform of an anti-tank officer, with shirt, tie and belt, and low lace-up boots. The tie, revolver belt and laces and the modest contents of my pockets had been taken from me by the corporal on duty. So I sat on the bunk and wondered why I had been placed in solitary confinement and not sent to the camp. Then the cell door opened and a sergeant came in. Hmm, sit here. He pointed to a stool. I understood. The bunk was for sleeping and the stool was for sitting. That was evidently the prison rule, and I was quite indifferent as to what to sit on in the cell. As a matter of fact, I should have been content to be able to sit at all. However, I had to move, and I enjoyed pacing back and forth in the cell. Only when I got tired of it did I sit down and of course on the bunk. Immediately the sergeant came in. I must sit here. I immediately sat down on a stool, then started pacing again, and the performance was repeated which was burdensome for the sergeant who became angry. Apparently he thought I was particularly stubborn, but in reality I was just nervous. If I had to go to the loo, I could call out. During these outings I tried to look around as much as possible in the room adjoining the cell. Sometimes I would see some of the other prisoners. They were officers. I called quite often, and this, too, made the sergeant mad. In the meantime it was nothing but a manifestation of my nervousness. It went on like that for three days. Then the interrogations began day and night, according to a very sophisticated system. The sentry would look through the peephole, and every time I fell asleep he would open the door and wake me up with a poke under the ribs and a harsh, come on, and then take me in for another interrogation. In a small room invariably sat three well-rested British intelligence officers. They were seated in the semi-darkness at a long table in front of which I was placed, so that one could look me straight in the face and the other two would watch me from either side. The officers bombarded me with questions, a real cross-examination with the light of bright lamps directed at me. My play with the stool was my amusement. The English were apparently amused at being awakened before interrogation.
It was, however, extremely distressing to me to be roused from sleep each time, and forced to answer the same questions, from which I could not in the slightest degree determine what was wanted of me. None of the officers, about my age, spoke perfect German. He had studied in Berlin. His questions were favourable because they indicated an excellent knowledge of the area. My answers were thus intended to convince him that I was indeed a Berliner. It was a matter of establishing my identity. The other got it into his head that he must learn by heart all the stages of my career and the names of the units in which I had served. Three days passed again, and I still did not understand what they wanted from me. Finally it came down to business. They read me long lists of names of people I had no idea about. Do you know Major Shell? No. Do you know Captain Wonsorge? No. In this spirit the interrogation went on for a long time, but nothing came of it. Then I was sent back to my cell, and after a short time I was again placed before the beam of the searchlight. Do you know Major Skell? No. Do you know Major Wonsorge? No. The cell, the dream, the kick in the ribs, the shout, the searchlight. Finally, without the question mark, we know you know Major Skell. I don't know him. We know that you know Captain One Sorge. I don't know him. Camera, sleep, kick under the ribs, shout, spotlight, a new trick. You're lying. Major Shell admitted that he knows you. Yes, it perhaps, but I don't know him. Hey, Captain One Sorge also admitted that he knows you, and that you must know him. You're lying, damn it. No, I'm not lying. I don't know any Captain One Sorge. Back to the cell. It was hard to sleep. I kept expecting to be kicked in the ribs, shouted at, taken under the searchlight. I tossed and turned from side to side, but nothing happened. Gradually I fell asleep. Then the devil's game resumed. You're lying. You're lying. You're lying. Back to your cell. I've been wondering what to do. Every time I fall asleep they call me in, so I forced myself to stay awake. But I couldn't stay awake for long either. A devilish vicious circle. Gradually I got into the state they wanted me to be in. I began to search my memory to see if I had ever heard this or that name. I racked my brains to recall the many course attendees with whom I had ever been in class together. I began to doubt the veracity of my recollections, and I thought of simply saying yes, so that they would finally leave me alone and cease to wear me out with their questions. But at that very time they changed their tactics. A sergeant forgot a packet of cigarettes in my cell. During the interrogation they offered me a chair, put an ashtray and a box of cigarettes in front of me. But too soon they switched to a new method. I got control of myself again. No. Tell me, do you know Major Shell? I don't know him. But you do know Captain Wonsorge, don't you? No, I don't know him. Now they were getting nervous and frantic. The new remedy didn't work. Sell, sleep, kick in the ribs, shout, spotlight. Again, no chair and no cigarettes. You're lying. I'm telling the truth. At last, it's clear. You're from the werewolf organization. Confess. I'm sorry, what? It's true that I knew that small groups had been set up in various places, engaged in sabotage and sabotage, but I had no idea about the werewolf group. The British were probably trying to uncover an extensive secret organization. Do you admit to being a werewolf? No. I fought in the war, and my need for such matters is completely fulfilled. Why then do you carry a revolver? Yes. I had it on me when I travelled through Denmark. No one took it from me. Don't you know that carrying a gun is punishable by death? I've read about it, but this revolver is registered as a service weapon. I thought I should surrender it to my division. The British in the meantime had received information from the army camp which served to confirm what I said. The fact that I had left my division was of little concern to them. They were looking for members of the werewolf organization. This interrogation ended with a repetition of the question. No. So you know that carrying weapons is punishable by firing squad? That's right. Again the same accursed so true was uttered, which expressed a willingness to obey and bow to inevitability. But now at last the English had given me a chance to sleep in peace. They had evidently ascertained that I was not one of the werewolves. Two days later I was released. The British took me in a jeep to the garrison hospital where I could be treated. I was received by the chief doctor, a German, I handed in my soldier's book, I was provided with a clean bed, 
and I was taken back on the register. I received my allowance, food and cigarettes. After a few days I recovered, but the question still remained as to my immediate and more distant future. Outside the hospital the situation was bad. A considerable remnant of the Wehrmacht was concentrated in Schleswig-Holstein. In addition, there were many refugees from East Prussia and Pomerania. In the city, in the houses still habitable and among the peasants in the countryside, people crowded together in unbearable conditions. There was no comfort in the stories of the chauffeurs who transported goods for the Wehrmacht. The population was still starving. It seemed to me that my personal affairs were relatively simple. I had the option of either going to an army camp or citing my failing health, to press for my dismissal from the army and become a civilian. While I hesitated, Providence intervened, this time in British guise. A few kilometres from Flensburg were rich peat mines, where several companies of German soldiers were engaged in extracting fuel for the city. I was put in charge of one such unit and was once again the commander. My command centre was in a peasant's house. From time to time an Englishman would appear and look round the stacks of peat. We received a tidy allowance, food and an allowance for the fulfilment of tasks. This activity could not be satisfying, for I had long since become disgusted with military service. But at any rate I was spared the miserable daily effort of struggling for existence, for I could not have softened the hearts of the Holstein peasants in the search for food. They took advantage of the situation, even from refugee peasants, to take their last possessions that remained after the war and the many kilometres of wandering. I would get neither potatoes nor beetroot from the peasants, not to mention butter, eggs and lard, because I had nothing to offer them, while from others they got carpets, pianos, jewellery and porcelain sets in return. Besides, it was a consolation to me that I was still a soldier, but still engaged in productive labour. Each stack of peat provided heat for one room in Flensburg. Soon I was seconded to eat in. There I was given command of the military police unit, which in Schleswig-Holstein was made up of Wehrmacht soldiers. My small headquarters was located in Penitz, a sea not far from the Baltic sea coast, near Timmendorf and Scharbitz. This unit was staffed by paratroopers, land force soldiers and navy Oberfenrich. We had lorries for transporting supplies, all-terrain vehicles and amphibians for patrolling, and motorbikes for communications. Armament consisted of machine guns and rifles. I personally was again issued an officer's revolver by the British. After a few test shots I found it to be better than the revolver that had been taken from me at Flensburg. We were subordinate to the Royal Dragoon, the London Tank and Reconnaissance Regiment of the Royal Dragoons at Athen. Once a week a British major would turn up to have a look at his troops and make a review of the unit. I instructed a lieutenant to report to the front of the regiment. The major was fair enough to ignore it. His insignia indicated that he was not fighting at a desk. Our task was to provide general security and especially to protect the villages from robbers. For this purpose we sent patrols and posted sentries. No one was offended by the fact that these duties were performed with complete freedom of action by Wehrmark soldiers in full uniform. It was as if there had been no surrender at all. Schleswig-Holstein was a kind of reserve for the Wehrmacht. Here the appearance of soldiers was a familiar sight in town and countryside. But if we travelled to Hamburg on supply business, we attracted attention there. At night there was often a firefight. Our enemy were mostly foreigners who had served Nazi Germany in the Wehrmacht and SS Special Forces and had fled from the Red Army to Schleswig-Holstein. Keeping their Wehrmacht and SS titles, they formed real gangs, attacked secluded farmyards and delivered their prey, mainly pigs, to the black market in Lübeck and Hamburg. It was with these former allies that we fought. If it came to major skirmishes, we were assisted by the British in armoured cars. Cooperation was as well established in this respect as supply from German and British funds. We continued to be paid our allowances at the same rate as before in the Wehrmacht. Some of us, especially the gentlemen at Corps headquarters, believed that we were the German reserve in case of war between the former allies. Others were only preoccupied with the thought of reviving the Wehrmacht along the lines of the Reichswehr, which had emerged from the remnants of the army of the First World War. I saw my activities as a temporary escape from my situation, a chance to look around and find a quiet civilian occupation. I saw the many years of service as a professional soldier as wasted and my adherence to the prevailing system as a profound mistake. The daily concerns and needs of the soldiers under my command seemed more important than political events. Gradually I got to know the people of my unit better. 
In doing so, I discovered that the Oberfenrichs of the Navy were strikingly young and, moreover, poorly versed in military matters. I began to find out the details and soon found out that after the surrender their last chief had promoted a whole group of them without authority to do so. I could not help but think of the division in which I served at the end of the war. There were some ambitious men there who, during our march through Denmark, made sure that they were given the next rank in their soldier's book. I was offered to do the same, especially as I had been promoted to major in East Prussia. But I gratefully declined. I had no idea, of course, that these illegal promotions would later be recognized as valid. But everything remained the same for me until the summer of 1946. Although I was financially secure, I was still again and again tempted to look for a job outside the military service. So one day I went to Lübeck and went to the labor exchange. There was a real commotion when I turned up in my uniform and asked for a job. It was made clear to me that I should remain in my service. An officer who had received no other professional training and was competent only in military work could not expect to be given a job, and therefore could not be given a pass to the city. But I was lucky. In Lübeck I met Dr. Jurik Klairs. It was he who had tried to detain me in the Kohlberg Hospital because of Jondis, an Oberlieutenant of medical service in the parachute units. He was now a civilian doctor with a decent practice, and thanks to his Swedish wife's connections, a doctor with the Swedish Red Cross and the Young Men Christian Association, a Christian youth association whose members were mostly Swedes and Danes, he immediately agreed to help me. In the course of our conversation it became clear that he needed a chauffeur, and he asked me if there was a suitable man among my soldiers. Of course I knew one such man. The only valuable thing I brought home after many years of military service was a driving license of all classes. In civilian life I could not apply any of the stuff they had stuffed into my head at the many refresher courses. So I became a chauffeur for my friend Doc Talas, but two things had to be settled first. First I had to secure the place and get a pass to Lübeck. The labour exchange refused. There were quite a few unemployed chauffeurs and I should stay in my unit. I went to the head of the labour exchange. What do you want? I have the opportunity to start working as a chauffeur for Doc Tayas, and I would like to apply for this position. That's ruled out. We have other candidates. But Doc Tayas wants me. Stay in the military police. You're well placed there. You won't get the job. He was stubborn, but so was I. I didn't leave him. He looked at me with displeasure. Hmm. What else, Mr. Captain? The fact that he addressed me as captain did not shake me a little. But still, I did not give up my intention. Instantly, I had a saving thought. Mr. Superintendent, I will refuse only if you can send Dr. Klaas a Swedish-speaking chauffeur. Dr. Klaas attaches great importance to this, as he is treating the Swedish colony at Lübeck. Fortunately, I was not asked if I spoke Swedish. The head of the labor exchange telephoned, and out a job and a pass to Lübeck. Now I had to get my dismissal from the military police. After a lot of back and forth in Neustadt, I had one last conversation with the British officers and received my dismissal certificate and the military salary that was still due to me. In return, the British received a revolver. Thus was my belated surrender. It was the 26th of July, 1946.